Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, this is Pushing Boundaries, a podcast about pioneering research, breakthrough discoveries, and unconventional ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Thomas Wierney. My guest today is Dr. Matthew Reagan, Assistant Professor of Animal Physiology in the, now my French is very bad, so why don't you say it? Department of Sciences? Oui, Sciences Biologiques. At the University de Montréal, right? Biological Sciences, yeah. Thank you. His current interests include the role of the gut microbiome in hibernation, metabolic depression in diverse animal groups, including hibernating mammals and hypoxia tolerant fishes, and application of metabolic depression to human spaceflight. Though first a biologist, he's also a musician and songwriter with numerous music projects. In addition, he told me he's, a, he's passionate about aircraft, spacecraft, and history, and Mazda Miatas. Welcome, Welcome Dr. Reagan. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. It's nice to be here, Tom. Thank you. I was first attracted to your work when I read your paper on how hibernating ground squirrels recycle urine to maintain their muscles. Uh, the full reference for those of you who want to uh, read it for yourself is in a recent publication of Science, uh, volume 375, number 6579. So um, in terms of your research, Dr. Reagan, um, essentially what you have discovered, one of the things that you have discovered and written about is that hibernating animals find it hard to get the nitrogen they need to maintain muscles. But ground squirrels have got, have gut microbes that can break down urea to free up the nitrogen it contains. Have I got that right so far? You've got it right, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit for those of uh, those of my listeners who are not totally familiar with the term. Tell us a little bit about the gut microbiome. Well, the gut microbiome, uh, as you know, is a it's a community of microbes, um, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, but mainly bacteria that live on our bodies. Uh, and by far the highest density of those microbes can be found in our intestines, particularly in our large intestines. And just to put this in some context uh, for the listeners, the human body has roughly, depends on who you talk to, but we'll go with a recent estimate that I read. The human body has roughly uh, 30 trillion cells. So, 30, so we all have about 30 trillion human cells in us. But surprisingly, we have even more microbial cells, bacterial cells in particular. We have about 38 trillion as a recent estimate, the number of uh, um, uh, bacterial cells. And then on top of that, we have about uh, 25,000 genes in our genome, so each cell. And, uh, but if we look at the total number of genes that are available to us, care of our microbes in our gut, it's about three, three to 3.3 million genes. So we have way more genetic potential because of our microbes in our guts than we can offer ourselves, which is, which is sort of an interesting idea because, you know, it seems like we're outnumbered by these microbes in our own bodies, which, you know, can, for some people perhaps spark an existential crisis. But of course the microbes, we outweigh, even though we have less cells and less genetic materials than these microbes, our own cells, because they are so much larger than the microbes, of course, they far outweigh, uh, outweigh the microbes themselves. So, you know, if that's your metric for, uh, uh, for determining oneself, then we can rest assured that we are in fact, mostly human. Right. So now how does the gut microbiome contribute to uh, the survival of these hibernating squirrels? Yeah, so essentially what it comes down to is there is a trick that the a metabolic trick that certain bacteria in the uh, 
gut microbiota of squirrels are capable of that the squirrels themselves are not capable of. And it's the trick that you mentioned earlier, which is breaking urea, which is a compound that is used that, that squirrels produce and we produce. It's the main compound that's present in urine. And um, it can break, usually it's just wasted. Squirrels like us tend to pee it out. Um, but during, but the fact is there are important, um, uh, it's a molecule with important uh, resources in it in the form of atoms that are during the hibernation season, difficult if not impossible for the animal to come by because the animal stops eating. So one of these atoms in particular is nitrogen. There's a nitrogen, there's two nitrogen atoms in, in urea. And during the hibernation season, a hibernating animal, the whole point of hibernation uh, is to um, survive long periods of time when food is scarce in the environment, very difficult to come by. So instead of um, uh, searching for food, which some animals have adapted to do throughout winter time, hibernating animals have adapted this trait that allows them to go prolonged periods of time without eating. So they can solve that problem of food scarcity by essentially fasting or starving themselves for, you know, for some species up to nine months of the year. Uh, now this is great for solving that particular problem, but it, it deprives the animals of a nitrogen source because them, like us, obtain their nitrogen through the food that they eat. So when they stop eating, there's no more nitrogen. And then the reason this nitrogen is important is because nitrogen is an essential and important molecular or atomic building block for proteins. That's an essential component of the amino acids, which together combine to make proteins. And proteins, as you know, are responsible for basically all of the functioning that occurs within, within a cell. And even during the hibernation season, when the animal is largely inactive, it is still highly reliant on all sorts of proteins to uh, sustain survival, even if it's a, um, you know, even if it's more a state of just surviving rather than living, normal living as it would do in, in the summertime. So what these microbes allow is the urea, which would normally be shunted to the bladder and then excreted during the summertime. In the wintertime, it's instead transported into the gut lumen, in particular part of the large intestine called the cecum, where there is a super high density of bacteria. And it is split into its component parts, freeing up that nitrogen and then allowing that nitrogen to either be reabsorbed by the, by the animal and then used, we found evidence uh, uh, in various tissues of the animal that it is then used or repurposed to uh, synthesize new proteins so as to enable continued protein production throughout winter time when the animal doesn't have an exogenous or dietary source of nitrogen. Or it can be used by the microbes themselves. Uh, and, and the microbes themselves can break that microbes break the urea, but then they can take those nitrogen atoms and the carbon atom that's present in the urea and then use it to synthesize um, uh, important molecules for their own survival. Because these microbes, like the squirrel, the microbes are along for the ride. So it's the hibernation season for the squirrel, but because the microbes are along for the ride, it's the hibernation season for the microbes too. So food is difficult for them to come by because they most microbial, microbial species are reliant on food flowing through the intestines that the squirrel eats. So when the squirrel stops eating, most of the microbes are now looking around for a food source, or if they can't find one, they die off. Um, so this urea becomes really important for both the, uh, the squirrel and the microbes that reside in its intestines. So um, in, in your research, have you paid any attention <clears throat> to sort of what happens to the neurons and the brains, so to speak, of these animals? Or is that not part of your interest? Well, I'm interested in it. It's not part of my research. Uh, um, it's something that I would like to um, get into. I've recently just started my professorship here. And so I'm currently building my, my lab group and um, something that I would eventually like to get into because a lot of the hibernation phenotype or the trait of hibernation is controlled centrally. It's controlled in various regions of the brain. So one of the major features of hibernation, uh, in fact, the major feature of hibernation is 
a profound reduction, highly regulated and, and reversible reduction in metabolic rate by about the species I study, the 13 line ground squirrel, it, it reduces its metabolic rate by about 99% relative to a typical metabolic rate during summertime. And so this is occurring at the cellular level, the cells in the body reduce the rates at which they are using energy. And um, the, the consequence of this is body temperature of the squirrels dropped. So typically squirrels like us have a body temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius that they maintain, that they sustain in consistent level, or it varies a little, goes a little bit up and a little bit down just like us, but there's a processing center in the brain, the hypothalamus that allows body temperature to remain at approximately 37 degrees by a various uh, feedback loops. Right. Now during hibernation, when the animal induces this deep state of metabolic depression called torpor, what happens is its body temperature drops because the source of that heat to maintain 37 degrees, which is typically above the temperature around the squirrels like it is for us, the heat comes from, it's the byproduct of the biochemical reactions or the metabolic reactions that are occurring in all the cells of the body. And so when those all slow down by 99%, for example, the rate or the, 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 the quantity of heat that they are producing as a byproduct mm -hmm. is proportionally reduced. And so body temperature drops. Now, typically for a squirrel, like for us, if body temperature drops, uh, the, the, this is sensed by the hypothalamus, which then activates a number of processes throughout the body that allow uh, that body temperature to, to rise back up. And this is what prevents our body temperature from dropping and is one of the main reasons why, uh, uh, or is related to, one, to, to, to why we cannot induce these states of metabolic depression like hibernating mammals do because our, uh, our brain essentially takes over and drives that body temperature back up, which it does by increase, largely by increasing metabolism. So countering that metabolic depression. But squirrels have an ability to reset that thermostat in their brain uh, so as to override any processes or any, any, any desire of the brain to increase the body temperature back up to 37 degrees. So it allows body temperature to fall to about five degrees Celsius where it stays during its state of metabolic depression, which in the winter time, they last for about, um, in this species for about two weeks, and then the species will arouse, it's called uh, an interbout arousal, where its metabolic rate goes right back up to normal summertime rates for about 12 hours, and then it drops back down again for two weeks. And it's all throughout winter, you see this periodic increase in metabolic rate every 12 or so days. Um, and that's all controlled by the brain, that's all, that's all they're sensing going of, of, of various, it's still not known why exactly what the trigger is for those interbout arousals, but there are, there is something, there are various hypotheses for why they are, why hibernating animals do this. Um, uh, and they all rely on the ability to sense some factor that over the course of those two weeks in that metabolic, depressed metabolic state, something or some, some suite of things more likely is drifting away from stable homeostatic levels and needs to be reset. And so that is being sensed at the level of the brain and the processes to the, the, that uh, activate processes to increase metabolic rate are being controlled at the level of the brain, but sensed elsewhere, of course, too. And um, so the brain, to answer your question, the brain is, uh, is uh, it's highly involved in this process, but it's not something that I have, that my research has, has, has yet touched on. Well, if I mention, you know, some of the research that I did on the Arctic ground squirrel, mm. you're familiar with. Very uh, familiar, yeah. Okay, so it shows that hibernation devastates the central nervous system of these animals. The neurons shrink, and thousands, if not millions, of vital connections between brain cells shrivel. Extensive pruning occurs of areas necessary for long-term memory, such as the hippocampus. Upon recuperation, the Arctic ground squirrel, as well as the majority of hibernating animals, according to some of the studies that I've read, 
demonstrate intact memory from their past by kin recognition, identification of familiar as compared to non-familiar animals, and retention of trained tasks. Uh, so that might be something that you could be interested in in the future. Oh, very much, yeah. And there's some really neat, so I'm familiar with that work. Yeah. And there are some really neat images of, uh, like one of, the, one of the things that happens during those 14 days or so when the animal is, is, is in this state of metabolic depression is the dendrites of its neurons retract, they pull in. And so the connections between neurons Gone. Broken, exactly. And, but they're able to, over relatively quick periods, that may be involved, for, you know, that, that is something that changes over the course when the animal arouses for those 12 hours, there is a re, those dendrites, partly because the temperature increases back up to 37 degrees, but those dendrites uh, uh, regrow and connections are reformed. And there, there are some really, in, I mean, there, there are obviously, like you said, um, uh, some consequences to this in the form of, or potential consequence, hypothetical. It would be reasonable to hypothesize that things like memory, uh, depending on the region of the brain where these, oh. these connections were broken, that it could result in uh, memory loss, for example. But there are some really neat studies of like training marmots, for example, to like, you know, before they go into hibernation, and so like run around a maze. And then they retest, you know, the marmots would learn it and would learn the maze and do a great job and get their little reward. And then testing them again after the hibernation season with the hypothesis that they're not gonna, they're gonna have to relearn this whole thing. And there is a latency period where right after they emerge from hibernation, they are a little, you know, clumsy, uh, like bumbling their way through, but they, they learn far quicker than they learned the first time. Uh, and so the current thinking is, and there are the, those studies were done, uh, um, uh, 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 not, not very recently, but there are more studies that have since been done that is demonstrating that, no, these, the, the memory, if it is lost at some point throughout the hibernation season, or if it's, if it's negatively impacted, maybe not lost completely, it is recovered um, once the animal arouses. So it's not like it has to relearn everything every, every spring, which is, you know, yeah. a nice thing for these animals. <laughs> So how do you think that this kind of study that you have undertaken and that you continue to lead, how, how, how will that apply perhaps to human spaceflight? Well, this, so this particular study um, with the, the gut microbes recycling that urea nitrogen back into the protein pool, this has potential implications for spaceflight in that during when, when, when a human is in the microgravity or zero gravity environment of space for prolonged periods of time, the load on their muscles is uh, highly reduced because for you and me here sitting on earth, we're under a constant one, we're in a constant 1G environment, which means gravity is pulling us down and our muscles, our postural muscle, various muscles in our body are always uh, working to keep us upright. And so we have a load, a constant load on our muscles that when a human goes to space uh, is no longer present because there is no gravity, or at least there's, there's very little gravity depending on where they are in space, of course. And so what happens for humans, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts and any crew member in space is they, their muscles start to atrophy or their muscles start to shrink because they're not under this constant load that, 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 that keeps them well-toned and in good shape. And so this is the reason why uh, space flight crew members spend so much of each, so much time each day uh, working out and why it's such an important um, thing to have uh, exercise equipment aboard the International Space Station where, you know, people are spending at least six months, usually sometimes longer uh, in this microgravity environment. So as to reduce the rate at which their muscles uh, shrink. But despite those efforts, those daily efforts at working out, their muscles do in fact shrink. And when they return to earth, invariably they have to uh, rebuild their muscle and that takes some time. So when one's thinking about, you know, a, um, I, I should say, so to draw an analogy to hibernation or, or, or to draw a parallel, um, hibernation is somewhat similar in that when an animal is hibernating for um, six months, say like the squirrels that I study, 
uh, for that period of time, even when it's in those interbout arousals, those 12 hour periods where metabolic rate goes back up, it is pretty much completely inactive. And so the load on its muscles for those six months is greatly reduced. And humans in similar states, for example, humans in bed rest, uh, humans that are confined to a bed for, for, for any number of biomedical reasons for prolonged periods of time, um, experience significant muscle atrophy, just like astronauts in space, because their muscles are not being used. And it's a case of you lose it if you don't use it or whatever that phrase is. And so uh, uh, this was the whole reason why we studied these ground squirrels is because hibernators, it's been known for some time that hibernators have this ability to avoid muscle loss despite those many months of inactivity and conditions that for humans would cause significant muscle loss. They avoid it and they maintain the muscle performance, their, their contraction force, et cetera, over the hibernation season. And so that was sort of the, the impetus for us embarking on this study. And we found that these gut microbes are able to help uh, or contribute to that process of muscle preservation, as well as other tissues we found in liver, for example. So bringing this to space flight, it's possible that if we could uh, uh, um, harness this, this, this ability that the hibernating animals have to use their gut microbes to recycle urea nitrogen and facilitate protein synthesis uh, in the muscle so as to reduce rates of muscle loss, that this could be used uh, as a potential countermeasure in the microgravity environment of space where astronauts are um, subject to similar conditions. So are our gut microbes or microbiome different from the ones in the Yes, they are, um, for various reasons, um, partly due to diet, for example. Diet is a huge, as you know, diet is a major influencer of one's gut microbiome, whether it's the differences between you and me or the differences between me and, and the squirrel down the hall in the lab. Um, so they are different, but what is really interesting is the fact that they're there are uh, some studies from the 90s that show that humans under certain conditions are able to recycle urea nitrogen in a similar way to what we observed in the squirrels. It's to a lesser extent, but nevertheless, it does occur. And so what this suggests is that the machinery to recycle nitrogen, urea nitrogen in this way, and then use it to help use that nitrogen to help synthesize proteins. The machinery seems to be in place in humans. And so what it may be is a matter of optimizing the way it works so mm -hmm. as to increase the, uh, uh, the, contra the, the potential contributions of this complex mechanism to the synthesis of proteins in the muscle. There are various um, so the mic, I've talked about the microbes and the, 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 the role that the microbes play in this process. And it's, it's, it's a critical role because humans, we cannot, we don't have the genes to build the protein, the enzyme called urease to split urea. So we are incapable of doing this. So, but the microbes do certain microbial species have this, um, capacity. So we, the, the microbes are an essential component to this process, but there are, three or four other really important parts to this whole process of urea nitrogen cycling that need to be in place for the whole process to work, for it to result in um, protein synthesis in, in the tissues of the host. And so that's the part that's really interesting to me with these other studies is that because there's evidence of this whole process working, it suggests it's not just that humans have the microbes that are capable of splitting urea, it's that we have these other steps of the process in place. Because if it was just the microbes, in theory, we could populate a human's gut, a person's gut microbiome with these microbial groups. Of course, that's complex and not, super, not as straightforward as it sounds, as you know. But uh, in theory, that's all it would take. But there are these other processes in place that would be or steps that would be more difficult to, to engineer and to incorporate into 
into a person. And the fact that we apparently can do this to some extent is, uh, is really encouraging because it says, it suggests that those steps are already in place. And so it may be a function of just optimizing or tweaking the system so as to maximize its, uh, its contributions to tissue protein synthesis. So in terms of benefiting humanity, it would be much more important to apply this knowledge to the millions of people who are bedridden and losing muscle because of lack of movement, uh, as opposed to space flight, which might involve only a few hundred people. That's, that's precisely what I, if I were to, you know, uh, uh, acquire a magic crystal ball and consult it and let's assume it worked. That's what I would get, that's what I think it would show me is that if this is, if this process is uh, successfully translated to humans, it will be in the context of its value here for people on earth. Yes. And then only after that adapted to the spaceflight environment, which like you say, you know, uh, there are, at any, how many people are in space right now? There's maybe six people aboard the ISS right now or something, but there are literally hundreds of millions of people who are currently in states of uh, uh, malnourishment or undernourishment. Every human after about the age of 40, something called sarcopenia, there's an onset of something called sarcopenia, which is a gradual wasting of muscles. So we're all, every human on earth uh, is susceptible to this. So I think just, Speaking from the perspective of numbers, there's far more value, potential value for this, uh, the trend, for this application for people on Earth. And I think, and it's probably easier to implement in, you know, a control, depending on what, how this ends up looking, if it's, if it's adapted to, to, to humans um, and the processes that are necessary. I just assume it will be more easily implemented in, for example, the hyper-controlled environment of a hospital or a lab, then it will aboard a, an isolated spacecraft in transit to Mars, for example. So um, that's my guess. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, but people seem to be most interested, and I can understand this, people seem to be most interested in the space flight applications uh, because that's just really, really neat. And, you know, this idea of, the, uh, the, the, the marriage of hibernation and human space flight is something we're all familiar with and it's been like a, 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 a plot tool in science fiction for 60 years or more. Lots so, of, it's yeah. a, then talking about people who are bedridden, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of yourself, was there anything in your own background that you think contributed to your interest in this subject? Um, well, I got into biology, I guess it's, I don't know how far back in my background you want me to go, but it started my interest in, it, I probably can draw a line straight from my initial interest in biology to, to this, and I'll try and okay. do so succinctly here. There's no rush. Um, when I, so I grew up in Ontario, a town called Burlington. Really? And, yeah, so not far. Okay. Yeah. Not far. Um, and my parents' house backed onto a hydro field, like just a field with power lines running through it. And at the end of the field, there was this forest, little like two acre wood type deal with a little creek running through it. And I would spend my summer, all my early summers, yeah. My early summers that I recall were spent in the hydro field and in the forest by the, by the creek and rooting around. And it's memorable because it's, that was my first taste of freedom. That's when my parents let me go and wander around on my own. But also because uh, like what I would passed my days doing is just observing the animals. It was full of animals. And I was from at a really young age. It's my first experience of seeing animals really in the wild and seeing them go about their, you know, they, they had agency and they had a daily routine and so I would go and watch the animals, you know, snakes, uh, 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 frogs, squirrel, baby squirrels, I remember catching baby squirrels one time, lots of insects and 
spiders. But in the creek, I remember one day seeing the first time glimpsing little fish. They were probably little fathead minnows or common shiners. And watching them in, a, in the pool, a pool of water, and they were breathing. And I remember thinking, I was really young. So uh, this was all pretty novel to me. But seeing the, the opercula br clearly breathing, the fish were breathing, which was interesting to me because I was, I guess I'd never contemplated this, but I thought, well, I guess there's, there must be, they must breathe for the same reason we do, which is because oxygen, and there must be oxygen in the water. And that got me interested in this idea of like oxygen, our dependence on oxygen. I just was kind of infatuated with this and how different species, for example, crayfish, when I catch a crayfish that also lived in, in the creek, it seemed to have a very different way of going about breathing. And so I'd observed these animals. And I think this is probably normal for people who end up becoming biologists later in life is that they have some experience like this in their childhood that sparks their, their interest. Um, for me, I think oftentimes the, what's interesting is like how looking at these animals and wondering things like, you know, like where do they go during winter time or how do they interact with members of their own species or with members of other species? For me, the thing that was really interesting was like, how do they work? How are they working? Why is that fish, why, do, why does that fish breathe? And for that matter, why, why do we all have to breathe? What's, this, you know, what's the importance of oxygen, for example? And so I, that was kind of where it started. And you know, although I got into many things, many interests developed between then and university. When I did go to university, I went for biology and then when I did my master's, I actually, my master's was focused on oxygen transport in fish and a particular way that a really neat uh, ability that fish have to use hemoglobin in a, in a, in a, in a unique way um, to deliver oxygen in a very, in a highly efficient way. That's believed to be really important in the evolution of fishes in general. And so that was, it kind of came full circle at that point. But over the course of that, and thinking about how fish use oxygen, that then started an interest in, well, what happens when oxygen goes away? Because we know that lots of fishes are able to survive uh, for long periods of time with little, or in some cases, since for some species, no oxygen. So how, how the hell does that work if, you know, if oxygen is so critical to our survival? For example, if oxygen was pulled out of this, the, the room that you or I are sitting in, uh, you know, that's it for us within a few minutes. But for certain species of fish, they can go months um, with little or no oxygen. So that was kind of the reverse side of that coin. And so my PhD focused on that. And one of the ways that these fish are able to do this, to survive long periods without oxygen, is to induce a hibernation-like state of metabolic depression. So it reduces its requirement for oxygen, which is a great strategy. If there's no oxygen or very little oxygen around, if you can reduce your metabolic rate, then uh, substantially, so uh, to match the amount of oxygen that's available, um, then that's a really helpful uh, trick mm -hmm. if your, your environment happens to go hypoxic for you know, a few weeks or a few months a year, each year. And so that got me interested in this state of metabolic depression as I learned more and more about it. My PhD focused on that in fishes. And then when transitioning to uh, after PhD comes, I was on an, I wanted to become a research professor. So the next step in that trajectory is a postdoc. So when it came time to do that, I wanted to really double down on this metabolic depression thing uh, because I, I was really interested in it. And I wanted to work with different types of animals, so um, mammals in particular. And I wanted to do, there's some other little goals I had, like I wanted to get, I'm really, I'm a huge space enthusiast and it was a potential opportunity for me to uh, develop a space related component of my research if I got into hibernation research. And it also um, allowed me to use new, learn new techniques that I hadn't used before that I felt would be useful for me going down you know, in the future of my research career. So for all those reasons, that's how I ended up uh, uh, doing this hibernation research in this particular project. So there's like a, you know, I think that's a fairly linear line <laughs> from that. It's a little bit long-winded there, sorry, but 
uh, that's how it all, that's sort of the, the, uh, the sequence of events that led up to this, this particular project. Are your, are your parents still alive? Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. Um, Do they understand your research? Do they know what you are up to? Well, they know what I'm up to. Uh, I think they're surprised that I managed to like turn this into a career. <laughs> like, thinking around down in like the in the ravine, you know, and refusing to come up for for dinner time and stuff. I think they're happy that I actually wrangled a career out of it. They they're not academics themselves. They they um they uh, uh, you know are not scientists, but they have been always been really supportive of me and even if they don't fully grasp the details, which is totally fine of the work that I do. I certainly don't grasp all the details of the work that they do either, or the work that you do, or, you know, we're all experts in our own areas. They're not experts in, in, in my area, but they are really supportive and always have been. And they make in, you know, in uh, what's really commendable is they really make an effort to, uh, to try and understand and to, um, to see, try and glimpse the things that turn me on about it all, mm -hmm. uh, which has been, you know, really, that's a really nice thing to have that support. Sure, and speaking of support, are you in an intimate relationship? I am, yes, I am. I have a, a wife, Emmanuel, and, um, yeah, I think I think we could classify it as intimate. Maybe she'd be the better the better <laughs> judge of that. <laughs> well, we have a child. We have a child, a young, uh, a young son, Jules, who is uh, two and a half. And then we have a new baby on the way, who's due to arrive September four. Is you know the date that we've been told. So we'll see. So that's coming up pretty quick. So uh, it's interesting with my son, Jules. Um, our vacations usually are large. Uh, a lot of our vacations see me down like searching, like in the ravine, searching through type. We were just in France and we were at some beaches on the Atlantic coast and searching as usual, searching through tide pools for different animals and stuff. And now, you know, my wife has always been, Emmanuel's always been great and patient with me. And she finds interest in this, even though she's not a scientist, she finds interest in it. Um, but now with Jules, with my son, two and a half years old, he was like, he's, he's getting to this age where he's starting to get turned on by this stuff. And, you know, I'm not going to force anything on him, but at that age, at least with Jules, it seems like he likes to duplicate the things that, uh, that I am doing or Emmanuel is doing. And so if I'm rooting around a tide pool, he'll be right next to me. He was right next to me, rooting around with me. And it's, it's a nice thing to be able to do uh, with my child. Yes. So uh, when you are rooting around on the coast of Normandy, uh, what are you looking for? I don't know, something, something, something that is able to eke a living and, you know, stave off the inevitable drift towards equilibrium and, uh, right. and uh, uh, chaos. It's it, like a tide pool is a very interesting uh, environment because um, it's highly diverse. There's a lot of, depending on where one is in the world, there are a lot of different species cohabitating in a very small environment. Yes. And it's cyclic, so it changes. So as the tide comes in, um, as the water comes in, then that environment disappears. And for the animal or for the, for the organisms in there that are capable of dispersing, then that, you know, that eight hour period or whatever it was where they were all together, um, is gone and the animals drift off. But for that period while they are confined in that environment, for example, fishes like, um, like a species like a tide pool sculpin, which, uh, which uh, you know, as the name might suggest, spends a lot of its time in these tide pools. It lives in that intertidal zone. When the tide goes out, they are trapped in that little tide pool for eight hours. And that environment is highly, highly variable. Over those eight to 12 hours or whatever it is, uh, however long the tide is out for, various factors change significantly. So when, when the water first recedes, 
the water in the tide pool is typically at the same temperature as it was when, as the ocean, when, uh, uh, when the tide pool was filled. But over the course of the low tide period, if the sun's out, temperature can rise significantly. And so that environment can go from a relatively low temperature to a very high temperature in a very short period of time. Similar changes happen for oxygen, but in the opposite direction. So it will go from a completely oxygenated environment to a near anoxic environment by the end because of the, uh, um, the lack of mixing uh, and replenishment of new water. And the fact that there are a bunch of organisms highly packed densely in the small environment that are each sucking back the oxygen themselves. And so it depletes the oxygen. Same things happen for pH, for CO2, highly dynamic. And so over this period of time, you have all of these abiotic factors that are changing that, you know, those sorts of changes for us would be significant and in some cases fatal. But for these organisms that have adapted to live in these environments, they're highly resilient to it. And uh, it's just a really neat, it's an example of uh, just the uh, uh, what select what what natural selection and continued selective pressure for various traits is capable of allowing animals to do. And it's such an accessible. It's not like one has to climb Mount Everest yeah. or or go into uh, the Amazon uh, rainforest to find some neat biology. It's you know if one lives on the coast, it's literally just walking down at low tide and finding all of these amazing animals doing uh, that express all of these amazing phenotypes that allow them to live in such an environment. Right. Well, before we run out of time, tell me about your other life as a musician. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so this start, yeah, uh, uh, music is, I'm, I'm, I've long been a music fan. Um, and I write I write music during my between my master's and my PhD. I uh, I I took a couple of years there um, to get a job to pay off my student debts, but also to play in a band and devote myself to this or as much as I could to see if you know I could actually wrangle something out of like playing music. So that was fun, but I determined over the course of it for various reasons that wasn't the case, and so I pursued a PhD thereafter. But since then, I have, uh, and prior to that, but since then, I've maintained, um, uh, that's like my thing outside of science. That's like a, a major hobby of mine. It's less prevalent now that Jules has been around and that I've started, you know, as a research professor and, and learning French for my job and all of this stuff that is requiring energy so time. How many albums have you actually produced? Uh, I've made... Um, I think in my PhD, I made five or so. So some of them are. Diaz, Daniel. Diaz and Daniel. Oh, yes, you have them. Okay, yeah, Diaz and Daniel. That's solo. So that's just me. Plays all. I play, I play various. I play drums, bass, guitar, piano, sing. I do all that. So that's just me. And then there's others. It seems, it seems like you have them in front of you there. I do, I do. I'm looking at one which is D as in Daniel, the 90s. And it's... That way, yeah, that's a, that's a recent one. That's, uh, I did that one during my postdoc. Uh, there's other ones too, like uh, uh, there's some, there's the Getaway Cars. That was uh, my first album. That was the band that I had between my master's and PhD. Uh -huh. And there's... Um, then there's the one with astronauts on the cover, D as in Daniel. Yeah, that's another Diaz and Daniel album. And, There's, and, do you have some there called Les Petits Nuages? That's a band I have with my wife. Yes. She sings. There's one, There's a, I have a, a band. Um, Is that projects with like, so I have a recording project with a friend called uh, Stranded Sailors. That was another one that's in there somewhere. Which is called Femme, Le Petit. And that's, a, that's a Petit Nuage one. Is that your wife on the cover? No. No, that's just, uh, that's another beautiful French woman. <laughs> Certainly is. Very attractive. Very attractive. Yes. And oh. what is your interest in the Miata cars? Tell me about that. Well, the Miata is, uh, it's just very much, I love 
yeah. certain aspects of cars. I love driving. I love operating things that move, oh. whether they're powered by myself or, or powered by, in that case, an internal combustion engine, which you know may or not, may not be a sustainable practice. But the Miata is entirely consistent with my philosophy on okay. what it is that joyful about motoring and what was originally joyful about motoring in that um, it's small, it's lightweight, it's not, it's got a small, relatively small and it's very small engine, then especially the early ones. Um, it's not ostentatious or pretentious. Mm. It's just, it's almost impossibly small when one uh, uh, gets in one or one stands next to one. It's like a go-kart. And it's, it's, uh, they're just so practical. They're, they're, they're relatively cheap. Um, the first generations in particular, the ones from the nineties. And it's just, it's just, uh, it reminded me of uh, when I, I, we don't have a Miata anymore because Jules, it's two seater, but prior to that we had a Miata. And it just driving each time I get in it, it would make me feel like that first time when I pulled out of the driveway, my parents' driveway in, in my parents' car. And it was a sense of freedom. And it was, I'm in control of this. It's all, it's, it's, it's just, it was a, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great vehicle. And for car enthusiasts, I mean, people are into cars for all sorts of reasons. You know, it's, it's like music, like just, you know, if I was into say, uh, you know, classical music and you were into Gigi Allen or something, we'd both be into music, but we wouldn't have a whole lot to talk about because they're so different. And that's the same thing with cars, uh, that there are different reasons why people are maybe into cars related to you know, engineering, aesthetic, a lot of people are into them for like luxury type things, which is, you know, not, not my thing and um, conspicuous displays of wealth, which is, is not my thing, but I'm into them for, I just love the act of driving and that feeling of uh, freedom and control. And the Miata is designed from the beginning and it stayed consistent since it was introduced in 1990 as people who like that sort of thing uh, as the car for people who like that sort of thing. And so it's just, uh, it's perfectly in line with all the things that I love about motoring. Mm -hmm. So have you ever thought of buying an MG, like a British motor car, green? When you say that, Thomas, so when we bought the Miata, we bought the Miata when we lived in Vancouver, uh, you know, I don't know, 2014 or something. And before we bought the Miata, the car we went and drove was a 1976 MGB. I don't know how familiar you are with MGs, but it was a rubber bumper MGB. So the cheaper ones, not as the, by that point, there were laws that required it to be slightly higher. It was an inch higher. So it's handling was a bit more, less sporting, we'll say, but it was great. And it was driving it. It was just such an experience, like the, the, it, it's a beautiful little car. The smell, the the feeling of the steering wheel, and but it felt like we had to drive it very delicately. And MGs, as you probably know, if you asked about MGs, you may know that they are not super reliable. They're pretty easy to take care. Of. There's lots of parts out there because they've been so popular. So there, you can fix them, but one should prepare for being stranded on the side of the road every now and again with them. So then after. So, oh, what's that? Not, not for winter driving either. No, no, not at all. Well, I guess it technically could be done, but in Montreal here, I, I, uh, I, would, I, would, I would have tremendous respect for someone who committed, who daily drove an, uh, an MGB in winter here. But then we drove a Miata afterwards. So we said, okay, well, that, that was neat, but let's go try this Miata. And driving the Miata was just, it didn't, we didn't, I didn't have to feel like I had to drive it so delicately. And not that I'm an aggressive driver, but one of the beautiful things about, especially we bought a 1991 Miata, which was a 1.6 liter. They produced 115 horsepower and they had about like 99 pounds foot of torque. So they were not powerful, but they're lightweight. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not particularly fast. And that's never been the point of a Miata. Uh, but what it allows is one of the things that's in line with my you know, this philosophy of mine or whatever the things I enjoy is that it allows one to drive it fairly with a bit of, you know, a, a little bit aggressively or with a bit of a, a little bit of passion, we'll say, because you're not going to get into much trouble because it doesn't go very fast. So you can drive it aggressively, you can shift quickly, you can use the transmission, which in the Miata is just an absolute pleasure to use the manual transmission. And, you know, you'll get it up to be cruising at 80 kilometers an hour. You have to put it in the fifth gear. So it's like you're, you, you're able to use the car and drive it in a sporting way. Whereas a car like, you know, a, a more powerful vehicle um, is pretty much, even if it's capable of like now, like what people have, what, what current supercars are capable of, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's inaccessible and it's unusable. Um, so it's, you know, it's a completely different approach to it. And so the Miata I felt after driving it was like, oh man, this is just, this is just, just, this is the car. So it was obvious after driving it, but the MG at some point, I would, you know, I would love to have like a, maybe like a, a mid sixties, mm -hmm. early generation MGB or an MGA. I love MGAs as well. They are like, you know, uh, I think they're even prettier. And they, Elvis drove one uh, in, uh, is it Blue Hawaii, the movie? It's one of his early films. Uh, and it's just so great. So we'll see, there may be an MG, uh, but it'll have to be a second car. We'll need something a little more practical with, with two kids. <laughs> Probably, yes. So before I leave you, uh, one question uh, I asked all my, guests a final question most important thing you have learned in your life so far hmm. uh, maybe that time is the most important resource, mm -hmm. far more important than, than other resources one may think of, like money. Yes. But you know, oxygen <laughs> is important. <laughs> oxygen is important. Unless you're a goldfish and can go long periods of time without it. But uh, yeah, to make them, I, I guess um, in my experience, yes. you know, I'm, I'm of the belief that I don't know what happens after we die. And there's no evidence to suggest that there's, there's anything. So for all we know, this is our brief glimpse of consciousness. And, you know, 80 years or 90 years or whatever it is, they can go by pretty quick, I would guess. So uh, uh, that's what we have. And so um, I try and stay mindful of that. You know, sometimes it's easy to get lost in certain things that maybe later on one would feel aren't the best use of time. But I try and stay mindful of that. And it's becoming as, you know, as I'm sure it's common as one ages, um, it's becoming more and more uh, apparent to me and something I think about at a higher frequency. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, let, me, let me thank you, Matthew. This was totally fascinating. I wish we, we had more time, but perhaps uh, we'll meet again. And I look forward to it. Thank you. And uh, let me just say that my guest next week will be Dr. Nirosha Murugan, Assistant Professor at Algoma University in Ontario, Canada who will discuss with me her research in regenerative medicine and cancer biology. So that will be, I think, kind of an interesting follow-up to our discussion today. I think it will be. And good luck in all your future enterprises. Thank you very much for having me on, Thomas. It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.